very good afternoon to everybody. It is a great pleasure on behalf of the Atul Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Policy Research and International Studies at the Maharaja Sayaji Rao University of Baroda. My name is Shakti Sinha. I am the director here. We do this every Friday webinars on international studies and on public policy. And we've been doing it now for about four months. And we picked up a lot of steam. We try to get a good balance of people with experience, young scholars, different background, so that for our people who are listening in, and we have many people who listen in every week, they will get pressure to see that. We must be doing something right. But our aim is obviously to bring a diverse points of view, but obviously of high quality. And we just don't get diversity for this, but we really get strengths from different societies. Today, our speaker is Dr. Pooja Paswan. She's an assistant professor at the Jamia Millia Islamia. She spent her last year at the Kennedy School of Government at Howard. She has a PhD from Jamia, an MA from Mignu, and a BA from Delhi University. She's won a number of fellowships, including an associate fellow at the Indian Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla. She was a founder fellow of the American Society of Public Administration. Lots of awards. She has a published book, Financial Administration of India, 2015. She has many book chapters and many, many reviews, and many, many articles, journals, which I'm not reading out because the number is simply too large for me to go in. But she has been quite active in the field of public policy, chairing, organizing, and doing all kinds of attending courses, doing different kinds of events around it. Her teaching profile includes, as I see, public policy, financial administration, ethics and governance, comparative public administration, office management, administrative law, and disaster management. And today she's speaking on a subject which is very dear to me, which is public policy design and innovation in India. Public policy design in India and innovation. She would be speaking for about half an hour or so, 30, 35 minutes. And then as usual, we'll open up for questions and answers. So once again, welcome all of you. It's a great pleasure to see so many of you here. And Dr. Pooja Paswan, over to you. Please unmute yourself, Pooja. Ah, yeah. Thank you, sir. A very good evening. And thank you, sir, for a very kind introduction. I'm grateful to Otto Bihari Vajpayee Institute of Policy Research and International Studies for giving me the opportunity. Uh, I'm grateful to Professor Vyas, Professor Dholakya, and of course, Shri Shakti Sinhaji for inviting me. Uh, as uh, uh, said, my topic uh, on which I'll be speaking on is policy design and innovation. Uh, so, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, so this paper I've been teaching for quite a while now, almost nine years in Jamia. And uh, whenever I uh, start this course, this is one of the papers in MA uh, in public administration. And uh, whenever we start the course, students are often confused about public policy and who designs and who implements the policy. Are people actually supposed to see innovations in policy? And is a policy just a last mile resort and a last mile address from legislator to executive and finally to the citizen. So when we uh, one second, yes. So when we discuss about uh, public policy innovation, we often tend to see there are several key factors that define your society and define your uh, uh, your design of policy. The socioeconomic factor. Where is your society currently based? Is it an emerging economy? Is it a developed economy? Is it uh, an economy in transition? Because those factors will eventually lead to how these societies and how these uh, economies will develop and design the society, uh, the policies. Then comes the socio-political factor. Do you have a stable political uh, uh, environment? Is it still transitioning? Are there a lot of agitations? Are there uh, uh, repeated uh, unrest? So then again, these factors often tend to uh, define the trajectory of how policy is conceived and accepted by the people. And then comes the socio-cultural factor. Now, socio-cultural factor, although in the policy design, is often 
uh, disregarded by students. But I often tell my students that a sociocultural factor and a sociocultural background is a reminiscence and a reminder of what that particular economy was in the past. Giving an example, when we think about Punjab, the uh, the one thing that comes to our mind is a sarso ka saag and makkee ki roti. Now that is a cultural uh, a trend a tr uh, attached to that particular state, but we forget that sarso and makkee can grow in an area where uh, it grows in a drought prone area. And Punjab used to be a cold desert before Green Revolution. So then again, uh, these small, small adages and these small, small factors which we attribute, cultural factors which we attribute to these certain areas, to these particular societies are a reminiscence of what these societies were and how the tra uh, trajectory and how they have transcended across uh, you know, different eras and different decades. And these factors then again, uh, build on helping and shaping the design of policy. What kind of policy is being conceived right now and how it is going to affect your life and the life of your children from 10, 20 years from now. You know, so Punjab after Green Revolution, yes, became the weak bowl of India, but is also battling with an excessive drug problem, is also battling with, uh, uh, you know, excessive uh, problem of foreign expatriates, uh, a problem of brides being left behind and their own particular challenges, right? So then again, all these three factors do culminate and add to how we perceive the public policy or a policy design as of now, and what are we thinking and how it's going to shape your life 10, 20 years from now. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs pyramid. Now we teach this in public policy theory. Now, if we look at uh, uh, this particular pyramid, the base of the pyramid, uh, you have physiological need, you have safety needs above, belongingness and love needs, esteem, and self-actualization, right? Now, um, according to Abraham Maslow, he says that every need ceases to be, acts as a motivator and ceases to be a motivator when it is fulfilled. So everybody, every human being in order to survive needs physiological needs. You know, you need food, you need warmth, you need water to survive basically, to, to survive as a human being. Then again, you need to feel secure and you, to, you need to feel safe within your environment in order to survive as a community. Then you need relationships, families, and uh, uh, your existence in a community, your acceptance in a community in order to be, in order to feel uh, as a part of a society. And then comes esteem needs and self-actualization. However, what has been observed that in developing economies, the physiological need and safety needs define 90% of your public policy structure. You will have a public policy in regardless of any government which is in power, focusing on food security, focusing on accessible to clean drinking water, focusing on housing, focusing on uh, reducing maternal mortality rate, focusing on reducing child mortality rate, focusing on providing universal access to education. So physiological need and safety needs happen to form 90% of the public policy design of developing and emerging economies. Whereas the developed economy, having taken care of their physiological and safety needs to a considerable percentage, 90% of the physiological and safety needs, basic needs is met, can focus on belongingness, esteem, and self-actualization. So if you happen to walk into uh, uh, you know, a diner in US, and you shout USA, USA, they will chant back. Try doing it in India, that's not gonna happen. However, now looking at that, uh, the kind of policies that take shape along with this pyramid, you will find that the government is focusing on meeting these basic needs. Hence the need for innovation takes a backseat. You will find economies like in, in developed economies, People are willing to take risks. People are willing to create, to be job creators. People are willing to have their own startups. Microsoft was a startup. Facebook was a self-start company. Uh, Twitter, Google for that matter. All these uh, innovations and all these technologies that have changed the face of the world were started by some daring, some individual who did not have to worry about the bottom to the pyramid because it was taken care by the state. You know, and hence, with that solid foundation comes the desire to attract and create 
better, better innovation. And that goes for governments as well. If your government is absolutely focusing on providing the bottom two uh, needs of the pyramid, then the top three tier will take a backseat. Will the top three tier will suffer? You know, so maybe. 10 years from now, you might start working on your belonging needs and esteem needs. But as of now, you're working on the bottom two pyramids. So 90% of your policy are going to address the bottom two uh, parts of the pyramid. Then again, again, looking at the society, this is the Greek's prismatic model. Now, Greeks talks about uh, that every society follows a certain trajectory, and this is a linear trajectory. You have agrarian society, then you have prismatic society, and then comes the industrial society. Now, agrarian society is a fused society. The, uh, uh, the uh, roles and responsibilities can be performed by anybody. There is no degree of specialization or the, the degree of specialization is very less. As opposed to prismatic society, as you can see, like in a prism, you know, you have a white light entering, it, it gets diffracted, and then you have the seven colors. So in a prismatic society, the left side of the prism where the white light enters and the right side where it is being diffracted. The prismatic society is a culmination of both the aspects, the agrarian society as well as the industrial society. You know, so you will find traits of agrarian society and traits of industrial society. And then comes the industrial society where you can see the white light has split into seven different colors. So you find a degree of specialization to be higher commercialization to be higher, urbanization to be higher, right? As opposed to the agrarian society where it's fused, it's together, it's, it's, it's culminated into one solid block or white light for that matter. So then we need to understand as to at this juncture, where do, where do you find your society to be in? You know, for example, Delhi, you would put Delhi in the diffracted uh, state. Bihar, you would put Bihar in prismatic uh, society. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Maharashtra, you would put it in Bombay, you would put in industrial Mumbai, you would put in diffracted state. However, Nasik or uh, Pune or then again, Aurangabad, you would put it in prismatic society or a prismatic state. Right. So then again, there are you, we have to identify as to the society, uh, where should we, where should we place the society in order to design that specific target, specific policy. Because if we have a blanket policy, it will address 90% problems of industrial uh, uh, societies, but it may not address even 10% problems of agrarian society. You know? So then again, so then again, when we tend to see that uh, aspect and when we tend to place these societies in, uh, in their proper dimensions, then target specific problem identification can be made. Target specific problem solutions can be made instead of just blanketly uh, proclaiming that this is a problem. Universal literacy uh, rate needs to go up. But imagine the challenges of a policymaker trying to bring up the literacy rate in a remote village where women are not allowed to go to school. In a remote village where there is absolutely uh, 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 you know, uh, a low per capita income, and it is mandatory for everybody to work in order to survive. In a in a in a city where everybody is comfortably placed, but they would rather prefer to work for themselves instead of getting an education. So these are target specific challenges, and we cannot have a blanket policy solution and expect to work out the way we want to. Right. Um, then again, when we talk about policy solutions. Now there is a very uh, very dear concept to me. It's called value fact dichotomy. Now, uh, giving an example, you can see the background of the uh, presentation. It's white in color. This is a fact. It's absorbing every other light. It's emitting white light. We have been taught in school that this color, which looks this way, is uh, uh, is white in color. It's to be termed as white. Of course, if, you, if you're a bit technical, you could go into off white and eggshell and cream and whatnot. But however, this is white for convenience. And then uh, that's a fact. But the value which I decide to attribute to this particular color will decide whether, will reflect on the decisions, the kind of decisions I make. You know, maybe the culture to which I belong, the white is a, white is a representation of omnius, uh, 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 you know, aspect. 
so white is worn in funerals white is worn when you know when something bad has happened so i would associate the color white with that particular value maybe i am from a culture where the bride wears white and white signifies celebration so hence i would associate that value with the color white similarly in your society there are several aspects and we meet in order to make a a sound and a rational policy decision or then again a target specific policy decision we have to exercise the value fact dichotomy in our decision making process so like in india education is given a a a high social value however when we talk about education and its employability we are lacking uh, then again in in our decision making process we have defined Ill literacy by certain parameters but are those parameters fulfilling in making citizens or the target beneficiaries aware that they are able to take better decision they are able to employ themselves in a manner so that they can support themselves and their families are they are that particular is that particular form of education helping their lives in any way or is it just that a fact that yes you have a degree yes you are literate you can sign your name and so be it you know it's not reaching it's not meeting any particular goal it's not meeting any particular target and then again so we need to identify in our decision making process while designing designing our policies that there has to be a we have to exercise a value fact dichotomy so that a standard rational can be maintained we need to look at certain problems more objectively you know taking a step behind and looking at the larger picture then comes identifying counterfactual the policies which you have uh, designed which are hovering over certain aspects let's say reducing child mortality or reducing maternal mortality increasing uh, institutional deliveries you know all these policies that you have attached with a uh, national rural health mission etc are they looking at addressing a part of the problem or are they looking at uh the problem in a broader picture most of the for example most of the public policies designed for women focus on reproductive health you have a uh, uh, matritva yojana you have janmi suraksha yojana you have kishori shakti yojana you have largely scheme you have several several uh, schemes which look at and uh, which are aimed at reducing maternal mortality reducing child mortality uh kishori shakti yojana aims at increasing the uh, nutritional level in young mothers or young women adolescent girls so that most of the women in india are anemic due to the lack of iron in blood and hence uh, this will address a certain problem however when you do a general survey even if you look around you you will find that a lot of women suffer from lifestyle diseases sugar bp uh, uh high blood pressure low blood pressure or something of that sort and there isn't a policy designed to tackle that particular ill there isn't a policy designed to look at that aspect we're just looking at the reproductive aspect why because we have signed some sort of a treaty and then yes we have to reduce the uh, uh maternal mortality rate and uh, child mortality rate so then again we have to look at these as aspects as well are we looking at the solution are we looking at a broader picture or it's just that target based solution all right we have to reduce this uh, particular factor we have to increase this particular parameter because we signed a treaty and so be it then again comes education now uh, recently the government passed nep uh, the new education policy and that particular education policy it's a beautiful document then again it aims to uh, capture the and address the problem of uh, primary education right from the start like sarv shiksha abhiyan aims and targets students from 6 to 14 years but according to a study uh, 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 i i think it was uh, again in, in harvard review or somewhere so some brain renowned journal according to a study the 90% of the child's subconscious mind and behavioral pattern is already established by the age of 6 so how a child reacts emotionally has been defined or will be defined by the age of 6 you know there's also a study that says a child's emotional behavior comes from the mother and child's social behavior comes from the father so how a child behaves socially outside of you know among relatives with friends is exactly how he or she has seen a father behave 
at home you know but how a child reacts when is uh, he or she is in pain or uh, you know when he wants something or when they're throwing a tantrum you know or how they handle emotional situation is pretty much a reflection of how they have seen their mothers behave you know coming to that taking that particular study we tend to pretty much neglect the emotional growth and the emotional quotient of children in this particular country and any be looks at molding the minds of the students you know before the age of 6 which is absolutely important to have young aware of responsible adults you know instead of just having a, a band of people with degrees but absolutely no uh, 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 not in possession of a logical mind to think for themselves yeah. so then again when we look at both these factors it's important to have a value fact dichotomy in order to look at a problem objectively and not just identifying and fulfilling a certain target but also uh, providing a solution that would go on to benefit the society as a whole and then again identifying your counterfactuals as well now while in the policy design um, we tend to use several tools and several measures this is a strategic triangle in a policy design uh, i i was told i will be given half an hour so i'm just going to quicken quickly explain uh, if you could look at the pyramid down below uh every policy has certain parameters uh to fulfill before it can actually go on and be uh, accepted or be implemented so then there is a technical correctness there is a political supportability and organizationally implementable is the policy design or, or designed by the government fulfill these three criteria now let's just say that sarv shiksha abhiyan sarv shiksha abhiyan is technically correct by technical correctness i mean that whether the policy so designed is fulfilling uh, uh, or addressing the problem for which it was designed sarv shiksha abhiyan was designed to increase the literacy rate to bring to reduce the school dropout so then again in terms of technical correctness has it fulfilled uh, its target to some extent yes in the pandemic horribly no organizational implement uh, implementability would mean that the the government is in possession or or the agencies which work with the government the ministries the the, the ministries in the state the departments in the state uh, have the capacity to implement the policy at the ground level at the grass level and political supportability that there is a considerable support from the political party endorsing this set public policy all these factors are then again important now if you look at sarv shiksha abhiyan it fulfills all these three criteria technical correctness yes we need students back in school yes we need to increase the literacy rate and we need to maintain the said literacy rate organizationally implementable absolutely the government has funds the government has infrastructure the government has the ways and means to fulfill whether it's doing or not that's a separate question i will put that as well political supportability your society acknowledges and recognizes education to be an integral part of the society Uh, it's it's a valued commodity it's a valued skill to have so ssa will get the political supportability in any given day when you uh, attach this with mid day meal scheme mid day meal scheme was designed on the basis of uh, on the lines of the hot meal program of us and uh, it happened to be a huge success mid day meal scheme was one of the programs which made the ssa very successful of course there were stories of the uh, mid day uh, substandard mid day meals uh, meals being poisoned etc etc and all that yes there have been several several stories but by and large it was responsible for bringing uh, students and parents sending their children for uh, to school just to get a hot meal or any kind of food for that matter so then again mid day meal scheme would also uh, acquire the technical correctness uh, and the other three parameters however now if you look at again hypothetically if we look at syllabus change now syllabus change happens to be controversial in certain districts in certain states now tech is it technically correct yes syllabus has to be revised syllabus has to be modified because your society is changing you cannot go on uh, keeping and maintaining 90% of your syllabus what your society was in the early 90s in the early 70s it has to keep evolving you have to revise syllabus of course it is technically correct is it organizationally implementable yes 
uh, you know, through scholars, through researchers, through teachers, through universities, one can do it. Now, just imagine elections are round in corner, you know, after another year. Will the syllabus change acquire political supportability? It may, it may not. You know, giving the example, I was reading the news, uh, the news yesterday, and apparently in Bihar, uh, the Jay Prakash Narayan chapter was being uh, removed, and it's acquiring a lot of uh, critique from the opposition party. Then again, uh, would this decision have uh, a political supportability before the election? No. Can you pass this particular policy after winning the election? Yes. So then again, where you are in the election timeline matters. You know, while designing a policy, you know, can the government pass SSA? It can pass SSA in any given day, whether you're close to the election, whether the elections are due in the next four years. Can it pass midday meal scheme, attach the midday meal scheme? Absolutely. But can you do a syllabus revision? You may, you may not. Then we come to designing of policy through theory of change. So then again, uh, you know, we define a problem. There is an intervention. Yes, uh, we need to increase the number of institutional deliveries because, uh, because of the unhygienic conditions uh, present in the home deliveries, uh, you know, and the inability to perform a C-section or uh, other complicated procedures, the MMR is quite high. So hence, yes, we need to increase the number of institutional deliveries. We also need to attach a certain conditional cash transfer, which will prompt women and families to send their daughter, daughter-in-laws and females for uh, institutional deliveries. Then again, the output would be that uh, there would be a decrease in MMR, maternal mortality rate. The outcome would be that by, uh, by uh, uh, this said policy, the community will be prompted to send the women and send uh, 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 you know, you know, women from their community and avail this particular program. So in policy advocacy, how the government announces a policy, how the government advocates a policy is very important. If we look at there are certain policies uh, promoting uh, girl child education, for example, Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao. It's not Ladki Bachao, it's not Kanya Bachao, but it's Beti Bachao. And the word Beti plays, uh, you know, has an emotional effect on the psyche of the mind. So then it's readily accepted. Largely scheme, a scholarship scheme, but it's called largely scheme. So it plays with the emotional mind and it plays with the psyche of the targeted beneficiary and it readily captures your attention. So how it is being uh, advertised and how it is being endorsed to the people is equally, equally important, uh, you know, for a policy to be successful or for a policy to be outrightly rejected. Then again, comes, like I said, comes the outcome that when we see that when uh, different, uh, the com women of the particular community are availing that policy, it acts as a catalyst and a motivator for other women to avail that set uh, policy. So this then again becomes a campaign in itself. And the impact then again, a long-term impact would be that there would be a reduction in MMR. Uh, you would have healthy uh, mother and a child. The mother's health is constantly monitored. The child's health is constantly monitored. The track record of vaccination can be kept, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a long-term impact, you know, when you design any uh, uh, sort of a policy change. Then again, when we look at self shiksha beyond, yes, the school dropout rate will reduce and students will learn something. However, are they learning enough to make themselves employable? That's the question we need to look at. Are they, are they learning enough so that they can earn and sustain themselves? That's another question that we need to look into. So through a, a theory of change, any policy design can be questioned, re-questioned, analyzed, reanalyzed, redesigned, revamped, and small, small innovation and changes can be done over the period of time. But then again, when we see what are the policy, what are the gaps in policy design? Uh, you know, so uh, one aspect would be the principal agent problem. The principal is your central government, which uh, conceives a policy based on a particular problem. Yes, we have, uh, 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 you know, uh, we have a problem of, uh, uh, again, a high literacy rate. Uh, then again, how do this particular problem is being perceived and tackled by different, different states? Bihar also has a uh, high liter uh, uh, illiter illiteracy rate problem. However, in certain states, 
families are more readily uh, willing to educate their children, educate their uh, male child as opposed to their female child. In certain uh, areas, families don't discriminate. In certain areas, families do not allow their girl child to study after a certain age because it, the society values marriage or the society values uh, employment over get, uh, getting an education. Education is time incentive investment. You know, in India, anywhere for that matter, it's a commitment. How many families are able to do that? So then uh, the government might have glorious scholarship schemes and wonderful, wonderful programs. Like recently, uh, uh, the current government, they initiated uh, a change in, in the PhD program where female students are given an extension. They, they get uh, an extension of one or two more years to complete their PhD, as opposed to the five-year extension, then one plus uh, another year, which the department grants, another year, which the vice chancellor grants. But the female students do get an extension, you know, uh, owing to the fact that they could be married, they could have other uh, engagements. So that kind of a sensitivity is required, target specific sensitivity is required on the part of the government in order to view a problem uh, as not just in isolation, but also how it's affecting the society as a whole. So imagine a female candidate, a female PhD scholar who's, uh, you know, who's pursuing a PhD along with the responsibility of a house and a family will feel far more relaxed and will, will be able to take, will be able to fulfill her other duties as well, you know, uh, knowing that there is the uh, uh, cushion of a possible extension, you know. Then again, we have misaligned incentives. Uh, not every policy, not every policy, if you go back to that uh, strategic triangle, not every policy fulfills uh, all the three criteria. You know, you might have a certain policy where uh, the, the uh, organizational implementability is not possible. You know, the government does not have the ways and means. The government does not have uh, the said, uh, uh, what do you call, the said resources. However, it's looking great on paper. However, it's looking it, it's appealing to a certain section of the society and hence, let's have it. However, you're very close to the election, so let's have it. So then again, these misaligned incentives then go on to create a larger problem for the society as opposed, including the government, you know, as opposed to having those target specific problems, which the government can then again uh, uh, look into. Correlation is not causation, you know. So uh, that's one of the aspects, that that's one of the problems of uh, uh, policy design. Just because we attribute education with employment does not mean that if you're uneducated, you will not be employed. You know, Just because we attribute degree, because there's always a famous uh, example given by a lot of my students, you know, uh, Bill Gates dropped out, but he dropped out of Harvard, you know, and uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But then again, the government and your, the society has to realize that just because two things are forming a connection does not mean that one is the cause of occurrence for the other. We need to realize that. And when we understand that, we will be able to dissociate fact from value and see the problem as a fact and without attributing our own values and trying to find a solution. Inadequate regulation, yes, it could be the fact that uh, while designing a set policy, the data collection and the, again, the cause and effect which the policy uh, maker is attributing does not correlate and does not concur with the solution, right? And of course, the general uh, factor of corruption. However, corruption is, is in itself a very broad topic. When I taught ethics and governance, I, uh, I tend to explain corruption as deviation from procedure. Corruption is deviation from procedure in administration. You know, so if you're deviating from the said procedure defined by the government, defined by the administration, defined by your organization, then the uh, your uh, it's most likely that you will be uh, slapped with a corruption charge. What are the gaps in policy implementation? Coordination failure, yes. Coordination between different wings of the government, coordination between different levels of the government, coordination between center and the state government, coordination between state and the district government. So then again, uh, with without a proper a channel of communication without a clear line of communication. Yes, most of the policy implementation after being designed beautifully, like Manarega, 
if you happen to look at the policy document it's very 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 beautifully designed you know it's very technically designed however in implementation it's another story right again organizational transformation and then again uh, uh certain values what kind of values your organization or your government attaches with the certain policy solution is the solution for illiteracy providing primary education subsidizing education you know or establishing forward linkages you know the nep new education policy talks about uh, bringing in vocational uh, uh, education you know and vocational education vocational studies is, is a big part of develop uh, the curriculum of developed nations you know where you learn a trade you learn a skill and then again you tend to start your own business you tend to you tend to uh, start your own venture and they have been very very successful you know however in india the mindset goes that if you are pursuing a vocational education you did you could not make it to a normal degree program and if you look at the success rate or the employability of the said degree programs it's another story you know so we need to destigmatize the 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 said mindset we need to destigmatize and uh, the onus lies on the government try uh, designing policies that will compel citizen and societies to think in that direction But like i said we are no longer in the agrarian phase we are also steadily moving out of the prismatic phase into the industrial phase if you remember the uh, rigs prismatic model and we cannot have policies still addressing the problems of the agrarian phase we cannot have policies still addressing the problems of the transition phase because if we do then the problems arising out of the prismatic phase and the industrial phase will never be addressed will keep piling on and then you will see you will probably say that you know the government is not working nothing works in this country and things like that right then again there are certain gaps in the policy implementation the possibility of elite capture the policy was so beautifully designed it was so wonderfully designed that uh, the targeted beneficiaries from for whom the policy was meant uh, uh, you know to uh, effect and uh, to benefit did were left out of the ambit you know so then again identification of targeted beneficiaries while designing policy is equally important rather than designing a beautiful policy and thinking that you know it's it's, it's going to address blanketly address the problem as a whole uh civil society mobilization for bad cause civil society play is an integral part in nation building in implementing policies making policy making people aware about their rights making people know that this is the way you uh, access this particular policy which is absolutely meant for you could be a conditional cash transfer could be availing health services at a primary health center could be availing a scholarship could be availing uh, you know money to build your house money to build toilets money to build a community center from the government anything for that matter but then again civil societies have uh, at a, uh, you know some time and again known to mobilize people for adverse causes as well you know so so then again here comes the a conflict between civil societies and the government and how the government tackles uh, such a conflict because then again uh, in in civil societies we're talking about ngos and of course civil societies when they approach people they approach in a very uh, in a very informal manner as opposed to the way the government approaches people and makes people aware of their policy and program so then when the government announced uh, and advocated sarv shiksha abhiyan they advocated with a very very beautiful jingle school chale hum it was a beautiful uh, line every year on rajpath you would find uh, one school dancing on that particular song it's a very catchy song yes but when the ngos and the civil society approach the said targeted beneficiary they look like them they are uh, they are in conversation with some members of that community so the trust which the community places on the civil society the members of the civil society is very high as opposed to the trust they place on the members of the government because a sarkari uh, Uh, a personal will be dressed uh, promptly will be dressed sharply will look slightly alienated as opposed to somebody from ngo who's sitting with them who's having chai with them who's uh, uh, you know who's interacting informally with them so then again that trust factor is a little bit higher and when these civil society mobilize these people for bad causes that causes problems uh, in the policy implementation then again 
should the government do business you know so time and again this uh, factor has uh, or this question has been uh, prompted has been asked that should the government uh, step in and design policy and implement, implement policy the way private organization uh, uh, you know address their problem should they do that one thing we need to understand public goods and externalities have changed the definition of public goods and externality has changed over the period of time so then again now uh, in in the 70s and the 50s where you would have uh, 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 you know this proper line roti kapda makan food cloth and uh, housing yes you need all three but you also need a wifi you also need a smartphone you also need clean air you also need access to drinking water apart from that consumerism is a big part of everybody's life you know so if you go in villages everybody has these broad smartphones with wifi and a, a, a data package that uh, uh, that allows them to be anywhere in the world etc cetera, etc cetera. so then again all these aspects should, should the government step in the market and should the government step in and regulate the public good regulate these externalities you know and to what extent should the government step in here that is uh, the ideal question which has been in play from from a very long period of time then information asymmetry the government tackles immensely and uh, it, it's it's a big challenge for the government uh, you know when information is skewed when information is tampered with regarding certain uh, policies and regarding certain uh, 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 access to certain policies then again what we saw again i'm taking up a contentious topic uh, 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 in, in terms of farmer agitation in terms of the farm bill the farmer of 1970 is no law, is very different from the farmer of 2020 the farmer of 1950 is very different from the farmer of uh, 2021 so then again you cannot have farm policies which were being regulated and implemented in the 1950s in the 1970s and expect that the farmer the poor farmer who's losing out heavily based on uh, the current trends and scenario and based on the current consumer preference to be uh, uh, to be uh, you know uh, benefiting from the obsolete policies so then again these aspects tend to you know these specific policy designs of the same farm policy has to come into play it is i know this is a contentious topic but then again let's have a discussion policies have to evolve because your society is evolving your government is evolving and if the government and the policies do not evolve with the pace of the society then there will there will always be a contention you will always find citizens questioning the uh, the decisions of the government that absolutely nothing has happened in the past so many years absolutely nothing has happened in the past uh, decade right uh, there are several external factors which add to uh, the policy design i i know i was given half an hour i'll quickly wrap up uh, there are several external factors which add, add to the uh, policy design which influence policy implementation you have pressure groups you have in, international organization in fact the clean the so called quote unquote clean air you breathe in delhi uh, is uh, for the fact that india signed a kyoto protocol and we had to lower carbon footprint and during sheila dikshit's government when uh, uh, the transport companies were forced to uh, the blue line buses were forced to switch to a, uh, cng i remember that phase i was in school there was a massive strike our school buses were not operating the government did not budge and finally uh, all the uh, tra uh, public transport had to switch to cng then again uh you have media uh and several social movements i'm reminded of this one particular campaign run by ndtv uh, long back and they made people aware of how to file an rti and because of which uh, people people uh, people got that information in hand and they filed rtis so you know asking about their uh, mark sheet and passport and and statuses of their applications that the government had to introduce a file noting system and keep certain aspects uh, you know under wrap so i remember that as well uh, so then again there are several several so social movements social uh, uh, movements by media which then go on to affect and implement your policy design when it comes to policy it's not just a political party whether in power or not in power or whether a part of the government 
or not a part of the government, legislature, executive, judiciary, and of course the citizen who are the stakeholders. But how many of us, like, do citizens really feel themselves to be a stakeholder? Because if you are a stakeholder, you would ask certain pertinent questions. You would question your future. You would question why is this particular policy uh, designed in the manner in which it is designed? And why aren't you bringing the innovations which will possibly affect my life after 10, 10 years from now? We have moved from socialistic to capitalistic uh, 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 form of society. We are now moving from state-owned resources and prompting towards market-generated resources. This is the future. And if you're in denial of this particular aspect, then you are willingly choosing to stay in the past when the world moves ahead. You know, you're willingly choosing to stay obsolete when the world moves ahead. And this is going to cost you in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, profit, not just monetary profit, but also social profit. If you look at the policy design right from 1950s to till now, you will find that all the said policies have been designed along these particular areas. Employment generation, providing access, uh, access to uh, uh, education, housing, public health, infrastructure, and security. Any policy. So you look at the employment generation policies from 1979 to uh, 2015. I'm just going to run through them. Or the education policies from way back you know, all the housing policies, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, every government, regardless of, uh, 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 you know, their political affiliation, uh, they have been designing a, a chunk of their policies, be it Bharat Nirman or any other policies along those deadlines, you know. So um, I know I've taken a lot of time, so I'm quickly going to con uh, conclude. We need to distinguish between urban and rural policies. Uh, the Modi government introduced target-specific urban policies and target-specific rural policies. Then again, we have to understand development is not urbanization. And that's where the biggest flaw comes in. When, when your government feels that you need skyscrapers, there should be malls in your villages, and hence you will uh, be con uh, uh, considered developed. That's a very, very wrong idea when, when we substitute development for concretization. Villages have their own space. Villages have their own importance in, uh, in an economy. And it's because of the villages and farmlands, India happens to achieve the said food security. And you cannot replace them. You cannot. However, you cannot neglect them as well. The, like I said, the farmer is evolving with the period of time. And if the government does, does not acknowledge, and if your society does not acknowledge that policies have to be restructured, to address and protect those farmers 20 years from now, 30 years from now, then you will see farm use, farmers use, and you will see farmers being antagonized. You will see farmers being victimized all over the uh, country. Forward linkages to po poverty elevation program. India has had beautiful, well-designed poverty elevation program over the uh, period of time since independence. But what is the forward linkage? When your MLA or MP comes to your constituency and uh, promises so many jobs, how many of us actually ask and uh, you know wonder what kind of jobs are there going to be? You know, if you're opening up or if you're constructing uh, an airport, an international airport, if you're constructing a mall, if you're constructing a university, know this that a university's shelf life is hundred years. A university can create an economy, ecology by itself. You know, there will be guest houses, there will be hostels, there will be photo uh, uh, start shops. If it's a medical college, there will be labs. So it provides economy, it provides employment by itself, but a certain kind of employment. Then again, if there's a certain industry that is being set up, it will generate its own kind of employment. But what about the graduates or uh, students who are graduating and a certain skill set possessed by your own constituency? Are you addressing that particular aspect or not? So a forward linkage to a poverty elevation program, a specific poverty elevation program is very, very important. Redefining public service. Public service, just as a society, has been has evolved over the period of time. I remember this uh, one aspect by uh, uh, pointed out by Sri Nitin Gatkariji in uh, <clears throat> in one of the Harvard conferences, where he said that public accountability of officials posted in a said district is equally important. They should be held accountable for their posting. You know, in uh, your stint as an SDM or your stint as a DM, what has been your contribution to the society? What has been your contribution to the said posting? And they have to be held accountable. You know, it's not a posting to just see the beauty beauties of nature, but what did you do for the people while you were posted there? 
modernization then again modernization we need to see the aspect of modernization in a very different way is modernization urbanization is modernization concretization or is modernization access to resources access to basic resources and as uh, i will just conclude government when government sees citizen as stakeholders they tend to design policies which will enrich their lives but when citizens themselves uh, they see themselves as stakeholders they will ask pertinent questions they will ask target specific questions when they will question whether this particular policy will enrich their lives in the coming future rather than just being happy that all right there is a policy that will take care of education is it taking care of your future we need to ask that with that i will conclude and uh, thank you sir for having me thank you dr puja paswan for your comprehensive analysis of the policy making as well as policy implementation system particularly in the context of india i am sure our students as well as uh, the academic uh, and other participants from different places who joined this webinar have benefited immensely from your webinar lecture today we will take up just a few questions today uh, questions which are relevant to the theme of the seminar and let me randomly go through this question first question is about the relevance of liberalization policy initiated in 1991 in the context of agricultural sector was this policy harmful for agriculture the reduction of subsidies to the agriculture after 1991 was it good for indian economy or it harmed indian economy uh, you may answer this question then i think we can take up the next one okay thank you sir uh the relevance of lpg uh, see we need to understand when uh, india moved to rao manmohan model in the 1990s uh, we were very close to financial emergency we were very close to uh, uh, you know risking our economy and uh, in the context of agriculture lpg was brought to strengthen the industry and the service sector agriculture was uh, dealt by green revolution however green revolution did nothing for the ganga belt it did for the wheat growing area you know so it changed the face of punjab it changed the face of north india but not the ganga belt which is the rice growing area and then again uh, the relevance of lpg like i said it strengthened your industry and service sector to the extent that it was able to for uh, fortify the economy in the 2000 when india experienced its it boom you know so when it companies created the uh, silicon valley out of bangalore which was initially a, a city where retired government officials used to go and settle it created it made bangalore into a silicon valley because the infrastructure was already in place it does not require heavy infra infrastructure it requires a soft infrastructure you need to have uh, uh, an extensive array of uh, optical fiber network in the country you know so the soft so the hard infrastructure was already in place since 1990 and in 2000 india took the benefit when it industries came forward for agriculture not so much like i said agriculture you need target specific policies in order to address the problems particularly in agriculture so hence for agriculture we have an agricultural bill which is being heavily contested by a uh, policy makers which is being heavily contested by certain sections of the society but then again like i said always ask yourself after 20 years the face of agriculture is not going to be the same why do you expect your farmer to be the same thank you dr pujay there is another very specific question that can we divide policies into two categories politically motivated policies and universally necessitated or relevant policies and if we can make this division what should be the proportion of these two categories of policies <laughs> that's a very good question uh, politically motivated policy and uh, universally uh, uh, accepted policy now you can you can design the policy but the policy which will be implemented will be politically motivated policy why because 
your central government is implementing the policy it will be passed in the parliament and technically political supportability is very much required very very much in indian context then again the universal whether whether it is universally supported that's a question and in current context particularly in a global context when india is a signatory of so many treaties policies tend to reflect the universal support you cannot have a certain policy because we are not no longer isolated what goes on in india is being seen by the whole world so yes the uh, universal supportability comes along with it if you are implementing a certain policy but political supportability cannot be negated because it's your central government passing the policy so uh, that's my answer uh, there is one comment actually not really a question which says that policy making in india tends to be based on superficial understanding uh, and the example that is given is about operation blackboard where the initial emphasis was placed on access to education more and more children getting enrolled in schools but later on it was realized that mere access is not important quality of education is also important and subsequently the quality inputs were integrated so do we have a very cogent well thought out policy making model or we just blunder through these things and then learn and then improve on them okay um that's a that's a very pertinent thought first of all uh, operation blackboard looked at the key aspect you need students to be in classroom before you start teaching them they have to be in the classroom first so one aspect of the problem was addressed that you bring them to the classroom then you start working on the quality of the classroom so the that particular policy should have been broken down into two aspects you bring the students to the classroom and then you focus on uh, increasing and making the quality better in the classroom you know by hiring teachers through teacher training through constant workshops by uh, by bringing in experts by engaging children within the classroom by innovative methods at these aspects so calling a policy superficial then again is 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 actually a little off handed and a little mediocre because any policy that is designed in india anywhere goes through a immensely technical process of identifying targeted beneficiary identifying uh, resources with the government uh, planning a five year plan chartering a five year course of action looking at the uh, organization who will be a part of the implementation process and then launching the program so it's a well thought out process however like i said several times it has happened that certain policies do not meet the target because they may not be technically feasible they may not be operationally implementable or they may not have a political supportability so like i said whether you want education for all or you want a quality education you know the distinction should not be there it should come together we should have it together sir thank you Uh, one more again. It's a comment. It's about the failure of policies in India. An example that is given is about Indian Forest Act. It's very technical. You may, if you don't have really reflected on it, one may choose. You may choose not to really answer it. That bamboo was excluded from Indian Forest Act, mm -hmm. and now grass is also excluded from this act. Possibly that led to the failure of, of this policy. something that possibly uh, mainstream academics may not really know about the exclusion of bamboo and grass i'm actually not aware i'm sorry definitely. i am so, i think definitely we take this point hmm. as his opinion let's see there was of course one question on interfaith marriages and all that but i think that's not relevant to the mm -hmm. theme of today's webinar so we may again take it as an opinion from the participant one again comment that citizens are rarely considered and their objections and suggestions are not taken very seriously in the policy making process so everybody talks about citizens but actually mm -hmm. they are they are not taken on board in policy making or in policy implementation so for that i would like to say the last point citizen as stakeholders you have to feel yourself you have to think of yourself as stakeholders and engage yourself in the policy process so there are several debates happening there are several uh, forums where you can put your point across 
uh, uh, you know, I, I, and your political representatives, there are several, several avenues where you can put your point across. So uh, a citizen of today and a citizen of 1950 is uh, in terms of their accessibility and in terms of the getting a point across and in launching their opinion on uh, any social platform are widely different. Are widely different. So you do have that. And if you're willing to make that effort, you can make that change. You know, so you're, you're, you're more stakeholder rather than more of a citizen. Citizens are now 100% stakeholders. You just have to be engrossed in that policy making process. Do you have the time and effort? Can you make that effort? Can, do you have that sense of commitment? And if you do, then yes, your policies and your points will be taken forth. Uh, of course, the last question now. Again, uh, not very clear, but it says that which policy approach has India followed since 2014? Is it rationalism? Is it incrementalism? Or is it strategic planning? If you can really categorize <laughs> to this kind of three categories. Can oh. we call to post-2014 policy making rational, incremental, <laughs> or strategic? Or all three, whatever. Uh, this question is obviously coming from somebody who's studying NPA because these are policy models. Uh, Post-2014 policies uh, can be uh, considered as both rational and strategic. See, policy making by design is strategic. You have to look at policies 10 years from now, like in budget. We look at the previous budget, this year's budget, and the next year's budget which we are, which we are making. So three years budget is considered. Similarly, in policy, you look at yourself 10 years from now, and you look at yourself 10 years ahead. And you look at the current situation. So you have to be strategic in a rational policy making. Then again, you look at, do you want to secure your present? And do you want to uh, make people feel that whatever changes are being made or the sacrifices they are being asked to make are comfortable enough so that the next generation will be well-placed? Like in terms of carbon footprint or in terms of green technology. Now, the CFL is costlier, but it gives you uh, you know, uh, 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 it's lighter on your pocket. It's also uh, protecting your environment and 10, 20 years from now, the planet will be safer for the next generation. You know, that's a strategic and a rational policy uh, model. Similarly, in terms of certain other policies like building more cold storages or providing incentives to farmers or uh, uh, protecting farmers or uh, uh, financial inclusion of, uh, uh, of people, it gave, it, it's giving people security. It's, it's securing their future for the next, after 10 years, for the next generation. It's forcing people to think, uh, you know, in the lines uh, from, from where they have never thought before. It, it's extracting people from their uh, so-called comfort zone. Do you think in 1990s, the opposition was as comfortable and as uh, uh, nice about LPG? Absolutely not. Even then, people said the government is selling the nation. Even then, people were scared of LPG and privatization. The previous NDA had a ministry called Ministry of Disinvestment. Mr. Arun Shori was the minister. And uh, disinvestment of Air India has been in news over the period of time, ha ever since. Ever since I was a kid, I've been uh, hearing about it, but it hasn't been so. It hasn't happened because these are strategic policy decisions. And they have to be taken in a very, very rational manner. So you cannot exclude the two. Thank you, Dr. Pooja. Uh, it was really an excellent intervention from your side. The nitty gritties of the policy studies, the macro as well as the macro factors, micro as well as the macro factors, both were delineated in your presentation. I know there are a lot of other factors and issues uh, that have cropped up through your presentation and the dialogue shall continue in future through formal or informal communications. So I do encourage our students to reflect further upon what Dr. Pooja has presented. And communicate with us with regard to those points. We in turn would be happy to pass it on to Dr. Puja for further elaboration or communication from her side. And we also do look forward to continued association between the Institute of Policy Research and International Studies of the Maharaja Sahaja University 
and Dr. Pooja Paswan of Jamia Media University. So we convey our sincere thanks to Dr. Pooja for sparing your valuable time and for agreeing to speak on this very important theme today. I also convey my thanks to all the participants who joined this webinar today and uh, raise questions and make comments to generate further debate on this issue. And we look forward to your presence again next Friday in our coming webinar. Thank you all and have a nice weekend ahead. Thank you.